control their division. They no longer have the controls that a regular cell does. That's why they, they become ultimately a tumor. Okay. Let's see. And uh, I'll leave that be. Okay. Let's turn our attention now to energy. Energy. This is the place where we're going to enter into another area of calculations. And so it's appropriate that we um, give this the, uh, the um, consideration that's necessary for it. All right? Here is uh, an equation that, of course, I'm going to give you on the exam, so you're not going to memorize any equations, just as we did before. But now we see something relating to energy. And the thing that's relating to energy, the energy that we're talking about inside of cells is known as the Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy. I described it earlier in the term as the energy that's available to do useful things. Energy that's available to do useful things. Those useful things might mean uh, making DNA, might be making proteins, it might be dividing, it might be catalyzing reactions, it might be a variety of things, but Gibbs free energy is, is energy that's available for the cell to do useful things. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question, Stuart. Yes. Every reaction that occurs in the cell is, is associated with Gibbs free energy. Is that a what? Well, no. No, you, you, it's not something that you're going to add up and say how much energy it has. You can certainly add up the amount of ATP that a cell has or something like that. Um, but Gibbs free energy is, is uh, something that's associated with every chemical reaction. Every single chemical reaction. There's a consideration of Gibbs free energy. Okay? Cells will try to minimize their energy levels. In fact, that's the universal tendency for everything. Minimize your energy levels. Okay. What does that mean? Well, if we, we're going to go through some calculations, and I'm sure you've seen these in your general chemistry classes, but I'll remind you. When we look at the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction, we can tell if the reaction will go forwards, backwards, or be at equilibrium by simply looking at the sign of the value of the Gibbs free energy. If the Gibbs free energy for a re the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is negative, the Gibbs the, the reaction will be favored in the forward direction as it is written. If the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is positive, the reaction will go backwards as it's written. And if the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is zero, the reaction will be at equilibrium. Now, I will tell you something I'm very picky about. <coughs> equilibrium does not mean equal. Get that in your heads. They didn't teach you that in general chemistry and they really should have. Equilibrium does not mean equal. Underline that. Equilibrium means the Gibbs free energy, the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is zero. That's what it means. It means that over time, the concentration of reactants and products is not changing. But that could be 10 times as much products as reactants. That could be 10 times as much reactants as products. It could be a million times as much. It just means that it's not changing over time. It says nothing about being equal. Okay? Make sure you do not get confused about that, because you will. Well. How do we calculate the change in Gibbs free energy for a reaction? That's where these equations come in. The change in Gibbs free energy is given by the value that's written on the screen called the delta G. Normally be written by a little triangle, okay? But I didn't have access to a little triangle for um, these notes, all right? So delta G equals, equals delta G zero prime. Notice it's not the same as delta G, but it's equal to delta G zero prime plus this term called RT 
concentration of products divided by the concentration, of, I'm sorry, RT times the natural logarithm of the concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactants. What does that all mean? Well, let's think about Henderson Hasselbach. Henderson Hasselbach, which I know that you guys were very fond of, okay, said what? pH equals pKa plus log of salt over acid. pH could vary, right? As salt and acid varied, right? And pKa was a constant for a given acid, right? The Gibbs free energy varies as the concentration of products and reactants change. Delta G0 prime is a constant for a given reaction. We see the parallel with Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Okay? We see the parallel with the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Delta G0 prime is a constant for a given reaction. I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. Okay? But it's a constant, just like pKa was a constant. Whenever we had acetic acid, we talked about a pKa of 4.76. It was always 4.76 if we had acetic acid. If we're talking about a reaction of glucose 6-phosphate going to fructose 6-phosphate, we'll always have the same value for the delta G0 prime. Okay? Now, R is the gas constant, so that's a constant. T is the temperature, and for our purposes in this class, we're not going to be changing the temperature. So the temperature is a constant. The only things that are varying here are products and reactants, and as they change, so too will the delta G. Let's think about this now. Is that making sense so far? Natural log term. How does that vary from a log term? Well, log term is base 10. Natural log is base E. The behavior of the ratio is exactly the same as it was for Henderson-Hasselbach. If the value of that ratio is greater than 1, the log term will be positive. The value of that ratio of products to reactants is less than 1, the log term will be negative. Okay. Now, um, what's going to favor a reaction going forwards? If I start increasing products, what's going to happen to the log term? It's going to get more positive. The more products I have, correct? As it gets more positive, what happens to the value of delta G? It gets more positive itself, right? When delta G is positive, what happens to the reaction? It goes backwards, right? Does that make sense? When the products start accumulating, that the reaction is going to go backwards, that's Le Chatelier's principle. That a reaction responds to it to a uh, disturbance to try to alleviate that disturbance. Casey, question? Yeah. Um, so when you say that, like a reaction goes backwards, you're talking general chemistry, like this. Like, this a goes to B, instead B is going to A. Okay, that's right. Okay. Okay. So when I talk about a reaction going backwards, whenever I write a reaction in this class, we'll write it as going both directions. It's bidirectionally. A can go to B, B can go to A. So it's going backwards, it's going that way. When it's going forwards, it's going this way. But it can go either way. Everybody got that? All right. So what does it cause for a reaction to go forwards? Well, let's imagine I start increasing the amount of reactants. What's going to happen to the ratio? It gets smaller and smaller, right? Less than 1, which makes the log term more negative. When I put more reactants in there, the reaction will be favored to move more forwards because the delta G will become more negative. Right? If I have twice as much product as I have reactant, which direction is the reaction going to go? It depends on delta G zero prime. Right? So I, call, I, got, you, I got a trick question for you right there. Right? If I have twice as much product as reactants, what's the value of the log term? It's positive, right? Everybody agree it's positive? Well, if this is positive, why isn't this positive? Well, there's another variable here. What's the delta G0 prime? 
If the delta G cell were prime for the reaction is minus 100, and this is plus 5, what's the value of delta G going to be? It's going to be minus 95, right? So delta G is going to influence the direction of the reaction. The only variables, though, are products and reactants. What's it going to take for the delta G to become, for the reaction to be favorable? Well, only if we make this more negative than this, if it's positive, right? What if the delta G zero prime is negative and I have equal amounts of reactant and product? I heard one equilibrium. Equilibrium does not mean equal. Okay? The reaction will move in the forward direction. Why? Because the log term will become zero, and the negative value here means that the delta G is zero. Make sense? What's that? Clear as mud? It's clear as mud over here. Anybody else? Is it clear as mud to anybody else? <laughs> okay, so situation. I've got delta G zero prime is negative. Products equals reactants. Which direction does the reaction go? The answer is it goes forwards, and the reason it goes forwards is that if products equal reactants, the log term is equal to zero. Zero plus a negative number is going to be a negative number, right? The reaction is going to go forwards. So in order for it to be an equilibrium, it would have to... Duh. In order for it to be an equilibrium, delta G would have to be equal to zero. Okay, that's what Okay. Makes sense, everybody? Okay, so you see how you can fall in the equilibrium trap? Don't fall in the equilibrium trap. Okay? It's important that you understand what's happening with that. All right. Now, uh, let's see. What else can I say here? Um, in order for this reaction to be at equilibrium, what would I have to say about delta G and the, uh, the log term? They're what? They're opposite. Equal but opposite. Plus 5 minus 5, right? All right. Now, well, what is it? Where does the delta G zero term come in? How do I get that thing? All right. Well, it turns out that the delta G zero prime term actually is the Gibbs free energy under one set of conditions. Under one set of conditions, the delta G zero prime term is the change in the Gibbs free energy. You tell me, when is delta G zero prime equal to delta G? when the reactants and products are equal. When we're at standard conditions, reactants and products are equal. Okay, They all are at one molar when that happens. When this term okay, becomes zero, delta G zero prime equals delta G. So we could define delta G zero prime. By the way, this is called the standard free energy. Delta G zero prime is called the standard free energy. The standard free energy for a reaction is equal to the free energy of the reaction under standard conditions. Standard free energy for a reaction is equal to the, the free energy for a reaction under standard conditions. Because under standard conditions, the log term is equal to zero. The standard free energy for a reaction is the free energy for the reaction when we're at standard conditions. OK, now, there are some examples. Uh, there are some problems in the book. If you want to, I, I think I may have even posted one or two problems online. If not, I'll post a couple for you um, that you should look at and think about. Because you've gotten used to thinking in log terms and these ratios and so forth in the Henderson-Hasselbach, I find most students find this to be not nearly as confusing as they find Henderson-Hasselbach. 
you're learning some new terms and you're learning where they're applicable. But, but it's important that you understand.